Let's give that to the Lord. Let's give praise to Him. Come on, everybody. Lift up your voice to Him. I thank you, Jesus. God, I worship you. I thank you and praise you. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I felt the presence of the Lord since showing up in Tulsa. And there's nothing more important or valuable to me than the presence and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. What tremendous preaching that we heard last night. And the Word of God was confirmed. The signs followed. Thank you, Brother Wells. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for hearing from the Lord. Brother Wells came and preached for us. I don't know. It's been several years ago now in Texarkana, and uh, wasn't nearly as known as he is today. And I told my wife, she can concur with this. I said, "This this guy is going places, and God's going to use him mightily." in the apostolic movement. And we saw that last night. Praise the Lord. Amen. He really did better than I intended for him to, but <laughs> I'm just joking. God bless you. God bless this youth committee. I appreciate you giving me the honor of speaking in the lives of young people. I know as a pastor that there's no group of people that I'm any more sensitive about people speaking into their lives than young people because they're such an impressionable age and time in their life. And, and uh, so I understand my responsibility this morning and I, I just appreciate you having confidence in me to speak to them. And then I appreciate Brother Booker and all these other men uh, that are here, men of God. You know, there's a lot of things that we could say when it comes to preachers, flowery words that we use to describe them. But there's none that is greater, no higher compliment that we could use than to say that a person is a man of God. And we have some men of God in this room today. Many of them have really been a blessing to me in my life and spoke, it to, spoke words to me at crucial times and been a blessing to me. And I'm looking forward to the ministry of these men that will follow me. It's so good to have um, my parents here today. It's also good to have uh, my aunt and uncle, my dad's brother and his wife with us this morning. First time that I know of that they've ever been in church with me. And they live here in the area, and I'm thankful that they took the time to come over and be with us today. It's so good to have my wife with me. I love her dearly. I appreciate her so much. A lady of prayer, a lady that loves God, lives this life to the T. And I appreciate that. And it's good to have Chanel, our daughter, with us. And today is my granddaughter's first birthday. Amen. I may be in trouble for being here. It's good to have members from our church and our youth group here with us. We appreciate them. Praise God. If you'll allow me, let's go into the word of the Lord to 2 Timothy Chapter number two, Second Timothy, chapter number two. As Brother Wells was preaching last night at a certain point in his message, a spirit of intercession came on me because he got right up in the message that I felt that the Lord had laid upon my heart. And so I was really praying that he'd get off of that. But I'm old enough now to realize that this is a confirmation that God has a way of linking things together. And I believe that he's going to use this today right in sync with what's going on in the Holy Ghost. I just want to follow the Holy Ghost, don't you? Uh, I'm, I'm not here to preach a sermon. I want to 
I want to deliver a message from my heart today. Second Timothy chapter number two and verse one, thou therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I was praying Tuesday in our church. I spent most of the day there seeking the Lord about this service. And I really feel like the Lord laid something on my heart to talk to you young people about. I believe that there is young people in this building that maybe over the last little while you've wondered, what is my purpose for life? What has God called me in his great kingdom for, for me to do? What is it that, that God would have me to do with my life from this point on? I believe before this service is over, clarity is going to come. A fog is going to lift, as it were. And God is going to help somebody and speak to somebody specifically. Hey, God is able to speak to young people. He's able to speak specifically to people that's been praying, God, I need to know direction. Anybody come to peak seeking for direction for your life? God's going to help you today. Let's lift up our hands towards heaven right now. Come on, let's pray together right now. Everybody across this room, I want you to pray with me right now. Jesus, I'm asking you to anoint I'm asking you to work. Pray in Lord for your will to be done. Come on, reach out to heaven right now. Hallelujah. Reach out to heaven right now. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Woo. Man, I just feel an assurance in the Holy Ghost today. You can be seated. The book of 2 Timothy is the last letter that the great apostle Paul would write. In fact, many theologians agree that it was written only weeks before his death. And apparently the apostle Paul is privy to this. He had a premonition of this because he writes in 2 Timothy, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. 2 Timothy is written with such intensity and the language that is used there is charged with such emotion that you can literally sense the urgency as the Apostle Paul is, as it were, addressing the next generation of apostolic ministry, his son in the gospel, Timothy. And clearly there is some things that he is wanting to get across. In the first few verses of this passage, he's giving point by point instructions on how to successfully live for God. But in verse 4, he says, No man warreth, no man that warreth, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. And there's another translation that gives a little bit more clarity to that. The ESV, it says, No soldier gets entangled with civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please 
the one who enlisted him. So this aged apostle is giving the next generation a stern warning about distractions, about divided loyalties, about carnal diversions that can sometimes creep into our lives. And to illustrate this, he uses an example that everyone then was familiar with. He uses the example of a Roman soldier. They understood that when a Roman soldier enlisted in the army, that there were certain qualifications. There were certain accepted restrictions that was placed upon his life. First of all, there was restrictions concerning his relationships. There was also restrictions concerning the things that he would involve himself in. For instance, he could not manage another's estate. He could not be involved in husbandry. Now, don't, don't any of you young men get nervous. That's, that's a King James word that means working in a vineyard. And uh, he could not involve himself in agricultural responsibilities because his primary purpose his primary responsibility was to be prepared and to be ready for battle. None of these things necessarily was inherently wrong. None of them were sinful. But while at war, full focus was required. Distractions could be fatal. And so he had to be ready his mind had to be focused. There couldn't be any distractions in his life. I don't know of a generation, to be quite honest, that has as many distractions as your generation. I can't think of any generation that previously that has any more things vying for their attention than this generation does. In fact, I'm the pawpaw up here. I realize that. Literally the pawpaw. And uh, I can take you back to rotary phones. You talk about analog being antiquated. I can take you all the way back to, to rotary phones. And if you got the number wrong, then it was uh, you had to start all over again. And I can take you back to two-party lines. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. But that meant that your neighbor and you shared a telephone line. That was in my lifetime. And I remember coming home from school and wanting to call friends to meet me to play ball and picking up the phone and hearing my neighbor's gossip on there and eagerly waiting for them to get off the phone so I could use it. But you can have five conversations going on at the same time via text. Now that's dangerous for me because I end up texting somebody something that I don't need to text them that was meant for another conversation. Can I get a witness? Sound like somebody else has had that problem. But you have all kinds of notifications on your cell phone. You have text and emails and social media notifications and all of these things are vying for your attention all the time. I recently read a study about this, and research shows that young people are actually not getting enough sleep because they place their phone beside them on the bed, and if it dings in the middle of the night, then they got to get up and answer a text message or look at an Instagram post, or they're fixated with, with Facebook. But I'm going to tell you, like last night in this altar, when the Holy Ghost gets to moving. When the Spirit of the Lord gets to working. And when God gets to dealing with people. There's something more important than the latest Instagram post. Or checking Facebook. When the Holy Ghost gets to moving. 
You're no longer concerned about being tethered to technology. But you're only concerned about being connected with Him. And in tune with Him. And hearing His voice. And basking in His presence. Oh, I feel my help coming. You know, something has been concerning me in the last little while. Because when I was coming up, I noticed that people, when the Holy Ghost would begin to move, they would linger in the altar. And I got to notice, and even in our congregation, that in the altar service, if it wasn't complete, in about five or ten minutes, there were some folks that were ready to go on to the restaurant and to fellowship. But sometimes, when God begins to move, it doesn't get done in five or ten minutes. But it's for that one that'll stay connected. You see, sometimes we pray to the point we feel the touch of the Holy Ghost and the power of God. And we feel like that's enough. But in reality, we're just getting connected. In reality, we're just getting started. In reality, we're just getting to the place where God can speak to us. And it's so important that we not be so wrapped up in the things of this world that we can't stay in tune with the Holy Ghost until He's finished speaking to us. I just wonder if there's any young folks in this house today that you're so hungry to hear from God. You're so hungry for a word from the Lord. You want the Spirit to move in your life in such a way. You'll say, God, if it doesn't happen in just a few moments, I'm here until you move upon me. Until I feel that lift, I will leave your presence. Come on, let's clap our hands and give praise to the Lord. Distractions, my friend. David Myers in Palm Bay, Florida, told a story. Several years ago, he would go down to the Amazon, fly into Mouse, Brazil, to meet with missionary Benny de Merchant, who recently passed away. And uh, several years ago, he, he went down for the first time, and when he arrived after 30 hours, I think it was, of traveling, he went and met Brother the Merchant at the baggage claim. And he was, he said, literally, physically wore out. And Brother the Merchant said to him, he said, if you'll wait just a minute, he said, I'm going to drive you to the banks of the Amazon and I'm going to go get the float plane. He flew a plane that had pontoons on the bottom where he could go into these remote villages in the Amazon and he said, I'm going to come get you and we're going to fly down to another place. And he said, Brother DeMerchant, I thought we were going to go to a hotel and I was going to be able to rest a little bit. He said, oh no, son. He said, we're, we're going to fly down to this, this village. And so he said that he was dropped off at the banks. He'd never been there before. Dropped off at the banks of the Amazon. And he said, I waited there with my bags for about an hour. And pretty soon I seen a small plane fly over and it landed out there in the water. And there was a, a signal that was given to a young man in a dugout canoe and he came over and got my suitcases and paddled me out to the boat and he said I got in that little plane and he said uh, Brother Merchant looked at him and said I understand that you're also a pilot he said yes sir I am he said well why don't you fly left seat and that's the pilot in command seat in an aircraft and he said I'll, I'll get us up off the, off the ground or off the water since you're not familiar with float planes and I'll get us in the air and he said then you can fly the rest of the way and so said I very reluctantly did that and after we were flying there for a little while he said I got to looking and trying to familiarize myself with the instruments and he said I got to looking at a certain instrument on the instrument panel and I noticed it's a very critical instrument but it wasn't working right and uh, finally I said brother the merchant what about this instrument right here it doesn't appear like it's working at all. And he said, Brother DeMerchant reached in his breast pocket and pulled out some yellow sticky notes. And he peeled one off and he put it over that instrument. He said, don't look at that. He said, it hadn't worked for years. Just keep flying. 
it's not exactly what you want to hear. He said, okay. And uh, flew a little bit further. He said, I got to looking at another instrument there that was very important. And he said, it wasn't working. He said, Brother the Merchant, what about this instrument? He said, he just reached in his pocket and pulled out that yellow pad of sticky notes, pulled one up, stuck it on there. He said, don't look at that one either. It hadn't worked in a long time. He said, before I was finished, there was about eight sticky notes up on the front of that plain instrument panel. And he said, brother, the merchant reached up and tapped an instrument on the top that was a GPS. And he tapped it and he said, brother David, he said, this right here is the most important instrument in this plane. He said, you just follow that and we'll end up where we need to end up. We'll arrive at our destination. Nothing else matters. And I come to tell some young folks in Tulsa that following the Holy Ghost, following the Spirit of the Lord, blocking out all the distractions, if you could keep your focus on following the Holy Ghost through life, you'll end up at the destination that we're all trying to get to. You'll stay in the will of God. That's the only thing that matters. Oh, somebody, let's give praise to the Lord right now. Come on, relationships are not as important as this. Making money is not as important as this. Your career opportunities is not as important as this. Materialism and what you can acquire in life is not as important as this. You better follow the Holy Ghost. You better stay lockstep with the Spirit of the Lord. He'll lead you. He'll guide you where you need to go. Now this is where I really started praying last night. Because there's no story in the scripture that illustrates this any more than 2 Kings chapter 10. And dude, you just about wrecked my sermon. But the Bible says that Jehu was anointed by God to clean up the idolatry of the land. And to clean out the Baal worshippers. And as he's driving, we knew, we know from reading the scripture that he drove that chariot fiercely. And he's driving that chariot down the road and all of a sudden he sees a shadowy figure, as Brother Wells so capably put it last night, standing on the side of the road, Jehonadab. And he sees him there and he brings that thing to a screeching halt and looks over at him. And he said, is your heart right as my heart is right? In other words, are, are you with me? Amen. Are we, we joined together in this? Oh, it's always better when you can link up with somebody. Come on, in the very beginning of this passage, the apostle Paul is telling Timothy, he said, don't rely upon your own strength. But he said, when you go, you better go in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. When you go, you better not go in your own strength, in your own ability, in your own giftings. You better go in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And Jehonadab answered in the affirmative. He said, it is. And he reached out and said, give me your hand. You notice it started in the heart. You know, it's not just what you do, but you can't separate what you do from what's in your heart. We got a lot of people doing things that's not in their heart. But if you ever get this down in your heart, you'll be a whole lot more effective in what you're doing. Come on, don't tell me how many scriptures you can quote if you don't have it in your heart. 
Don't tell me how apostolic you are if you don't have it in your heart. You better get this down deep in your guts. He pulled him up in that chariot and he said, come and see my zeal for the Lord. Come and see, amen, what's eating me up in my life and my heart and what I'm crazy about, what I'm enthralled with and what I get enthusiastic about. And I've always asked the question, how in the world was he able to respond at a moment's notice? I mean, it's like there was no hesitation. There was no questions asked. He didn't refer to his calendar and said, can we set a date, brother Jehu? Let me, let me look at, let me look at, uh, my day timer, and let's, let's, let's try to work this out. I'd love to go, but I just don't know if I can go now. I've got so many things on the schedule. No, I've always wondered why he was able to move with such haste and respond so quickly. And then it dawned on me. He was a son of Rechab. Ah, the Rechabites. Genesis 35, he referred to it last night when they were brought into the temple and they were tempted and the wine was set before them and they flatly refused the wine and said, not only do we not want anything to impair our minds and to inebriate us and to cause us to not be sharp and be able to, to think clearly and make good decisions and make good choices, but there's some other things that we don't do. In fact, we don't build houses. And we don't sow seed. And we don't plant vineyards. And we've been taught that we, because we're such a small nomadic tribe, and there is only, only way that we can be secure and survive in the land is for us to be nimble is for us to be agile for us to be able to move at a moment's notice we don't have the luxury of a big army we don't have the resources of a great nation but the only way that we could survive is we got to move when it's time to move we got to respond when it's time to respond Our Father told us that ye dwell in tents. Why? That ye may live many days in the land wherein you be strangers. In other words, Rechabites are not entangled, but they're swift to respond. Amen. They're agile, they're flexible, and they're sober. They're clear-minded. And when God says move, they move. When God says respond, they're able to respond. John and Dad didn't say, wait, wait, wait just a minute. Jehu, I know what you're doing is in the will of God. I feel God in it, but I got to go home, lock up the house. I got to go home and water the crops. I got to go home and prune the vineyard. Oh, no. He said, if God's in this, I'm ready to go right now. I'm ready to respond right now. There's nothing tying me down. There's nothing holding me back. I'm not attached to anything. I'm not so connected to this world that I can't respond to what God wants me to respond to. Come on, I think God is looking for young people that is not so entangled. Can I just preach this morning? not so entangled with the cares of this life come on don't let the world define what success is for you let God define what success is for you but I gotta have this and I've got to have that and I've got to, I've got to own this kind of car and I, I gotta I gotta carry this kind of purse and I gotta wear this kind of Come on, that stuff is killing us in Pentecost. Give me 
marry some young people at peak 17. And said, you know what? If God says go, I don't care where it is. I don't care what anybody thinks about it. I don't care if it's a popular thing to do. I'm not so tied to materialism. I'm not so tied down by worldly ambition. to go if God says go I want to go if God says I want you to respond I want you to respond the last years of his life brother C.M. Beckton lived about two and a half hours down the road in Dallas from where I live I'll never forget a story he told about his own personal calling. Brother Becton, as many of you know, was a very talented musician, and he started playing music when he was just a teenager. And uh, he was very skillful with the piano and the organ, and also some of us remember that old accordion and singing. And anyway, he's passed on now, but. When he was just 15, he, he started singing with what was known back then as the Stamps Quartet. And it was a very popular thing back then. He was traveling with them. And then they had schools, music schools, all across major cities of the South. And uh, I think the man's name was Fred Stamps. Brought him in, just 15 years old. And said, Cleveland, I, I notice something special about you. You're a very talented young man. I want to offer you a job in this music school and uh, I, and and he said I want you to teach students and and so he went over to I think West Monroe or Monroe and was was teaching in the stamps quartet schools that they had and very successful and and they they told him said we got your career lined up different stages and this is where you're going to be at a certain time and the money was good and everything was just I mean life was grand everything was perfect and he said, one day after teaching students all day, he said, I was going to leave the little studio room where I was teaching and walk out and get some fresh air. And I was the only one left in the building, and I knew it. And he said, I was walking down a, a hall. And I reached to push the door open at the end of the hall. And he said, suddenly, audibly, strong and forcibly, I heard, Cleveland! And he said, I... I knew I was the only one there. And he said, I turned around. And then I, I realized, because I felt the confirmation and the touch of God, I realized this was God dealing with me. And he said, I went, and I went back in that little room, and I closed the door, and I fell down beside that piano bench. And he said, God, I don't care how good the offer is. I know this is not what you call me to do. I know this is not your intention for my life. This is not the direction that you want me to go. But you have greater things for me. You want me to preach the gospel. You want me to carry this truth. Amen. And I give everything up. I wonder if there's somebody in this place before this service is over that might get just such a call from God. That God may pinpoint you and call your name and deal with your heart. Hey, I'll be honest, that's what I've been praying for. I'm going to tell you, never has the world been populated with so many lost souls as it is today. We need an army of young people to be called. We need to, come on, not just to go in their own volition, but to be called and ordained and anointed by God and used in the Holy Spirit. Elisha is just doing what he's been doing all of his life. Doing what no doubt his father had taught him to do and maybe had even been passed down from his grandfather. Plowing with the oxen. You know, it's kind of a dutiful job. It's not a lot of glitter and accolades for somebody that 
plows fields, but this was his duty. This was his livelihood. And it's kind of monotonous. It's just up and back, up and back. Plow. The view doesn't change much. When all of a sudden, a man of God comes by. And a man will brushes him. And he said, I've never felt anything like this in my life. And whatever this is, I, I've got to, I, I can't let this go. I, I've got to receive more of this. I've got to have more of this. And the scripture says that the prophet just kept on going. As if to say, what, a, what I have to do with you? Amen. What, what do you mean? And he said, hey, whatever you got, I, I need it. Whatever you have, I want to possess it. But the prophet just kept, I'm going to tell you, if you want an anointing, you're going to have to pursue it. If you want to be used of God, you can't just sit back and say, well, God's sovereign. And when God gets ready and when God wants to use me, come on, you got to explore. You got to search. You got to pray. You got to lock yourself away. You got to feel after him. You got to have a heart that is open. You can't be tied down to everything in this world and expect God. He broke that plow. He slayed those oxen. And he said, I'm going to pursue the anointing of the Lord. Come on, I believe God is going to call some young people up higher. I believe God is going to call some young people in this room to feel something that you haven't felt in all your life. You're going to experience something here today. Amen. The hand of God is going to settle on somebody in this place. And you're going to feel the touch of God. I'll never forget, I was driving down the road with my dad. He was here today, and uh, I graduated from high school and had put application in and was accepted to a program in a local college to become a chemical waste and environmental engineer. And they began to tell me all the promising things about this job, and I was looking for security and trying to find my place in life, and I thought, this is it. And I was explaining this to my dad. And my dad knew that God had other plans for me. He knew that I had received at a very young age a visitation from the Lord. And he looked at me and he said, that all sounds good. But he said, don't forget your calling. Wasn't too long after that, my wife and I, my wife and I purchased a trailer and truck. I think they got a picture of it. Now, I don't want any of you evangelists to get jealous. I feel a spirit of envy coming on some of you. I'm telling you, this is a rig, isn't it? Me and C.P.U. Kilgore started out about the same time. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, you know, that really wasn't that long ago. That was just an old truck and trailer. That's all we could afford. And I said, well, we're going to start preaching revivals. And uh, I said, well, how many revivals do you have? I had contemporaries that, man, they had to carry two calendars to keep all the revivals, to <laughs> keep up with everything they had going on. How many revivals you got, Calhoun? I said, I got one revival. They said, buddy, you're going to the West Coast with one revival you're going to preach one. You're giving up everything for one revival. I said, last time I checked, you can only preach one at a time. And when I get done with this one, I'll look for the next one. But I'm going to give this one everything I've got. Come on. You see what the problem is? Some of you want to have it all figured out. You want to have next year and five years from now all planned out. It didn't work like that. When the Holy Ghost leads, you got to take one step at a time. You got to follow God as God leads you. You got to step out in faith. You got to bid everything goodbye and say, God, I'm going to follow your spirit. My 
My wife had already flown out to California and uh, I'd purchased the trailer back in the Midwest and was going to drive it out there to meet and preach that first revival. I drove 14 half hours and stopped there in uh, Santa Rosa, New Mexico and pulled in behind a, a service station that was abandoned between some semis and was wore out and tired and got in the back of that old trailer, laid down on the couch. We had several of our belongings that we were going to store in California in there, so it was very crowded. You could barely navigate through the trailer. I laid down, and somewhere in the midst of the night, I was awakened by an explosion. And when I looked, all around me was just flames and fire. That trailer was literally engulfed in flames. There was only one door in that particular trailer. It was not the one that's pictured here, the one previous to that. And there was only one door, one exit, and it was through a good portion of that trailer from where I was up through the kitchen area that was crowded with things, and there was no possible way for me to exit that trailer. And I'm telling you, it was on fire. And I began to cry out to God, and you can believe whatever you want to, but this is just how it happened. I looked to my left off the side of that couch and where the back wall and the side wall come together, it was torn apart. And I fell right out on the ground. And God provided a miracle for me to be able to escape that trailer. Matter of fact, the fireman said when they woke me up in the middle of the night and I looked, he said, I saw those flames shooting up in the air. And he said, I knew that, that when those traders get on fire, there's only seconds before the total trader is engulfed. And there's no way that anybody in it can possibly live. I said, you're looking at a miracle. And I was in a little 10-bed hospital there in Santa Rosa. My face was blistered up. And I remember they, they led me up to a, a mirror that was in a restroom and and said, we don't want you to be frightened, but we want you to be able to see what's going on. And I looked, and there was portions of my hair that were singed almost down to the scalp. scalp. And, then, and then there was burns across my nose and on this side of my face. And a spirit of discouragement and despondency come on me. I felt like, man... All, everything I had in this world, every belonging, even the money that I had was still in that trailer, burned up to ashes. When we went back the next morning, it was just a flat bed. Everything was gone. I said, man, this is a way to start. And I stood there in discouragement, tried to, and, and the devil tried to say, you might as well go home. You might as well quit. You might as well give up. But suddenly as I was standing there weeping in the presence of the Lord, I felt something rise up in me. And I remembered that call that God had placed upon my life. And I said, devil, you know what? I could get disappointed selling shoes. I may as well be disappointed following the dream that God has placed in my heart. I'm going to fight through this. And from that day to this... God has taken care of me. I've never missed one bill. I've never had to put off one obligation. God has provided for my family. God has allowed me to pastor the great church that I pastor. I'm telling you, if you'll follow the call of God, if you'll follow the Spirit of the Lord, God will direct you. Come on, somebody throw up your hands in the air. And let's worship the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Jonathan Burrow, come up here, buddy. Right over here. Hurry, man. You can run faster than that. Brother Jonathan Burrow, you can see he's built for basketball. And he was standing right there. I don't want you to get too close. I look too short. He's 6'5". Anyway, Brother Jonathan Burrow lived in a, really it's a project over across the, the canal from, from where our church is located. And he and a friend were, was coming over on the parking lot. We had a basketball goal set up and they were coming over and they were playing basketball on the church parking lot. We didn't mind them playing basketball. We just didn't want them playing it on Wednesday night during church. 
And so one of the young men went out and said, you know, you fellas are welcome to play basketball here. He said, but we, we would like you to maybe not play while we're trying to have church on the inside. He said, but why don't you come to church? And so he started coming to youth on Friday night. And then he started coming to church on Sunday. He was a Sabbath day at Venice boy. And so he, I think, how old was he? About 14, 15 years old. And he was already playing basketball in high school. And, and God started dealing with him. And God started moving on him. And, and it wasn't long until he said, Pastor, I, I feel like I need to be baptized in Jesus' name. We baptized him in Jesus' name. And he got to seeking the Holy Ghost. And I'll never forget when God filled him with the Holy Ghost. I've never seen a smile that big. And I've never seen somebody jump that high. And this boy is a worshiper. He went back and told the coach, said, I got other things to do. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to respond to the call of God on my life. What do you mean you're going to give up all of this? He said, there's something higher that's calling me. I can't explain it, coach, but I feel a need to follow God. And uh, so uh, he went on and graduated with honors from his school. And, and then another, I guess, temptation came. And that was his family, all of them, because he had two scholarships, one of them to a very prestigious school in our state, full ride scholarship to go off to, to college. And uh, they, they had it all lined out for him. They had already uh, told him, you know, this is what you need to go into. And he, he had all of these ambitions and everything lined up. He came to my office and said, Pastor, what do you think I ought to do? I said, I don't know how to break this to you, Brother Jonathan. I'm certainly not against education, but I don't think it'd be good to jeopardize you as a new convert to go off into a place that I'm not sure that you would fit, and I'm not certain that there's an apostolic church there for you to go to. He said, that's all I need to hear, Pastor. He said, I'll turn it all down. I'll let it go. His family was upset with him, but he said, there's a higher calling. Come on, some of you need to quit worrying about what Professor Sigma Fruit thinks about you and start worrying about what God thinks about you. Hallelujah. And he just came and talked to me last week. I'd already been feeling this. He is a worship leader in our church. Uh, amen. And he said... Pastor, I don't know how to explain it, but I feel the hand of God on me, and I feel like I'm to preach the gospel Sunday. I said, right on, man. You just keep on following what God has put in your heart. You keep walking where God leads. I'm telling you, God's still calling people. You can be saved. God's still calling people. God's still calling people. God's still pinpointing people's lives. Come on, can I just tell you what I felt in the Holy Ghost uh, praying on Tuesday? I feel like there's certain young people right here in this room uh, that God has targeted you. Come on, you got a big old target on you that God has targeted you, that he wants to use you in this hour. Come on, don't wait. Uh, don't measure yourself by somebody else. Uh, don't compare yourself to somebody else's ministry. God's going to use your personality. God's going to use your giftings. Uh, God's going to use your talents. Uh, God's going to use your abilities. Come on, he can call you. You don't have to have a pedigree. You don't have to have a last name. You don't have to know somebody or be connected with anyone. If you've got a connection with God, that's all you need. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost sweeping into this place right now. Let's feel after God.
I can't tell you how strong I felt the impression that God's going to call some young people, young men and young ladies. You're going to feel it here. A year and a half before he passed away. I'm, I'm fixing to close. Brother J.T. Pugh came and preached for us in Texarkana. Brother Pugh had always been a hero to me. And uh, I'll never forget when I came to the airport to pick him up as he was walking out with all the other passengers. He had a Bible in one hand and a little satchel thing in the, in the other hand. And I said, Brother Pugh, we'll wait right here for your uh, baggage. He said, I don't have any baggage. I said, okay, you're going to stay three days? And that's all you got? He said, that's all I need. I said, is there anything that I can get for you before I take you to the room? He said, well, he said, I... He said, if you had a little buttermilk and crackers. I said, I don't know where in the world. I've never drank a glass of buttermilk in my life. I don't know where, but I'll find it for you, man of God. <laughs> and I sat down across from him in a booth in IHOP restaurant. And that man that I had only been loosely connected with, he looked across that table and he read my life like a book. After about an hour, he clapped his hands together and he said, Well, I guess I'm through. But while he was with me, he told a story that I've never been able to get away from. He said when he was just a boy, he, he'd lost his father in a tornado when I think he was very young, five, six, seven years old. And then his mother passed away when he was just a young adolescent and he was left with his older sisters and they raised him and they lived in a sharecropper shack in the back of a piece of property and they were left to just kind of raise themselves he said but I never thought not for a moment to quit going to school so every morning I'd wake up I'd go to school nobody had to wake me up didn't have to come in and talk me into going I, I just went and I'd walk to school, and he said, while I was there in one of my classes, he said, I was required to give a little speech. And he said, the teacher whose husband was the president or the chairman of the VFW Hall there in the little town of Noble, Louisiana, she noticed I had a little talent for speaking. And she told her husband about it. And one day I was walking down Main Street, and he said he'd come out of a that man that was the chairman of the VFW came out of a general store and saw me walking. He said, JT, he said, uh, my wife tells me that you're quite a speaker. He said, every year at our VFW hall, in our little chapter, we sponsor, we sponsor a young person to give a patriotic speech and we'd like you to be our representative. Would you, would you do that? He said, I'd be obliged to. He said, I got to tell you, if you win this competition, it goes up higher. And there's certain benefits. And he said, I was just a poor boy looking for a way out of that life and poverty that we were in. And he said, I went to the little district competition. He said, as it was, I won it. And he said the next level was to go to the state competition. He said, I took that speech and I won that. And he said the next level was to go to Memphis. And he said there they were having a regional, several states in the South were involved. They were going to have a regional competition. And he said, I, I was to go there. And he said, then it was told me that if you win the regionals, you go to national. And whoever wins national, JT, they get a full ride scholarship to an Ivy League school. And he said, man, 
you'd only have to know my life and the things that I'd been raised and the poverty that I was in to understand that I saw this as a way out. I saw this as a way of, 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 of bettering my life. And I just made up my mind. This was my only goal. I'm going to win that. I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to practice. I'm going to polish this speech. I'm going to do whatever I've got to do. And even 60-some years later, as he was telling me this story, he could rehearse that speech like it was yesterday with all the animation. It's quite an impressive thing. And he said, when I got to Memphis, he said they wouldn't, they had us back behind the stage and they wouldn't let us come out and listen to the other competitors. And he said, I was in there pacing back and forth and I was rehearsing that speech. And he said, there come a knock on the door. Are you JT Pugh? He said, yes. He said, well, it's your time. He said, you're mighty right. It's my time. And he walked out on that stage and he won that competition and he was scheduled to go to the nationals. During that time, his sisters, his older sisters who were very consecrated and praying people, they'd went up to Tupelo to Bible school and he said they were there and they were praying because they could see me going a direction that I didn't need to go and they knew that God had had his hand on my life and God had used me and God had a, a better thing for me and, and they were praying for me. He said, but there was quite a wrestling match that was going on, a tug of war that was going on within. He said, I remember standing in a middle of the winter it was freezing outside and he said it was a cinder block room it was cold and damp in there and there was one little old pot belly stove out in the middle of the room and he said I was in there practicing that speech and, but then God started dealing with me those praying people that have been praying for me I'm going to tell you something if you can make a connection with praying people if you can make a connection with people that know how to get a hold of God and listen to them, your life will be a whole lot easier. I don't know what I would do if I didn't know praying people. And he said, I started weeping. I could feel that God was dealing with me. And he said, finally... I felt the call of God so strong that I took that speech that I'd been honing and working on and polishing up for the competition. And I wadded it up and I walked over that pop belly stove and I threw it in the fire and said, God, I surrender. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I shudder to think what Pentecost would be like if it hadn't been for men like that that had obeyed the call of God. But I just wonder if there's another generation of young people in this room that's willing to put your ambition on the altar. Willing to put your plans on the altar today. I wonder if there's some young folks in this house that would obey the call of God as he bids you. Hey Amen. I feel like he's calling young people, even young folks that are still up there in those bleachers. You need to come down just as close as you can to this front and press in here and say, God, I want to I want to some way humble myself under your mighty hand. I need you. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how you're going to use me. I don't know. I don't have the confidence. I don't have the esteem in myself. I don't have the ability. I'm going to tell you that's not what's important. What's important is getting God's hand on your life. What is important is you opening up your heart to God. I wonder if preachers wouldn't help me in this room. I feel God is pulling on some young person's heartstrings. God's dealing with somebody right here in this house. I feel the Holy Ghost so strong in this place. Hallelujah. Let's reach out to heaven right now as they begin to sing. Would you come? Would you respond? Would you call out to the Lord? Would you seek the face of God?
knows who you are, sir. God knows who you are, young lady. What you called me to be. That's why. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only.